Hi, it's Dr. Sandy Laura Kramers coming from Visionary Eye Doctors, one of the surgeons here. Thank you for joining us for the EYE show. This is podcast 26. We're gonna do one last fourth episode on COVID-19, the pandemic that really hit the world in December uh, 2019. So we've been going through this for um, about two years. So I wanted to finish up on the kind of all the treatments, kind of report, most of the treatments reported for COVID-19. Every month there's something coming out that potentially could work against a virus. So we've gone through a whole series. This was based on the global adoption of COVID-19 early treatments. And so we were making our way, kind of going through the mechanism of how these work, uh, just to make up punchline again for the name of the game for everything with infections is to decrease the viral load and decrease inflammation. So those are the things that kind of will damage the tissues of your body, lead to hospitalization and death. So there might be an injury, it could be a virus or bacteria, in this case it's a virus, and then it leads to inflammation. And inflammation is the way we die. Inflammation leads to apoptosis in some patients, in most patients where the cell starts to have a programmed cell death. Uh, we know that there's a lot of factors that influence inflammation, but ultimately inflammation is a big component of scar tissue. So whether you have a heart attack and you have lack of oxygen, which leads to inflammation, which leads to you know scar tissue, or just general aging. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So most of these drugs that I already talked about are anti-inflammatory. Some of them directly affect the replication of the virus itself, which is an RNA virus. So we're gonna pick up with remdesivir. So remdesivir is the only FDA approved medication intravenous in hospital to treat COVID-19. It has a lot of positive data. It has some negative data. It's approved for certain patients only. Uh, it has a good study that was done that was shown to help uh, the death rates in hospitalized patients. So remdesivir is an inhibitor of the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase uh, in vitro. And it's been shown to help against SARS or COVID-1 and Mediterranean, basically um, the Middle Eastern uh, uh, Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, which was a type of, 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 of coronavirus. And so it basically was done in a study that was well done, about a thousand patients were done. And this is a patient that was, this is a journal article published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Beigel et al. And uh, they did a double-blinded randomized controlled study, which is one of the best. Uh, we, they, they basically took about 1,062 patients, and what they found was that the death rate was lower. So the mortality rate was 6.7 with remdesivir and 11.9 with placebo. And so there are some factors that you need to use with this. They basically gave it, it's all intravenous, and we're gonna compare this to the new uh, drug Pfizer, the Pfizer drug that came out uh, recently to basically try to prevent COVID, which is by mouth, a pill, but this is intravenous. So they gave a loading dose of 200 milligrams on the first day and then 100 milligrams every day for day and from day two to 10. And they compared it to normal saline injection in the intravenous. Honestly, I would have loved for them to compare it to inhaled, nebulized uh, hydrogen peroxide. Why not? I don't know why. So they basically did allow these centers to provide supportive care if it was written by the trial hospital. And we don't know what kind of supportive care every hospital had. Did, were they allowed to have chest PT? Were they allowed to have uh, ivermectin? I doubt it. Uh, were they allowed to have hydroxychloroquine? I doubt it. So there's some issues with the study, but in the end it showed to be effective. We know remdesivir is, um, a little concerning for the kidneys. It can cause some kidney damage, so a little concern about that. But in general, it showed it was effective. So that is the only one still approved by the FDA for use. Uh, actually, the, the new one, which is the pill, which I kind of want to go through also, is basically called molnupiravir, which is a small molecule ribonucleoside prodrug of N-hydroxycytidine, which basically will kind of cause the virus to create new mutations that then provide proteins that are not able to be used by the virus. So it's apparently very effective. It's a pill, you can take it home. There are some things that need to be understood about this. It usually has to be given within five days and it is uh, causing the virus to prevent the replication, as I mentioned. 
It's four caps of it, four capsules are given twice a day for five days within five days of the first symptom. The problem with COVID, I think many of you have either have loved ones that have had it or have had it. You're kind of waiting each day to get better. You don't know which way this is going to go. So by the time you're kind of getting yourself wrapped around, your brain's wrapped around the idea, oh my gosh, this is COVID, you're usually at day five or six. So by that time, it's kind of a little late. But this is approved for high-risk patients. So uh, basically, it is recommended for only patients that are 18 and older because it can affect the bone and cartilage growth. It is recommended for more people that have the higher risk of death, such as patients that have obesity, kidney disease. We're gonna go through those risks in just a second when I talk about monoclonal antibodies. One of the interesting things about this is that it's not known if it works against Omicron or any of the other variants. They suspect it will, but there's really no data. As is true for the vaccine, we still don't have great data to prove that it's super effective against the next variants that are coming along. We hope it is, but that data is still not clear. And then the last thing about um, the Molnupavir I want to mention is that if you take it, you cannot get pregnant. And if you're a man, you should continue on some form of contraceptive for three months after your last dose of Molnupavir. And I've had a couple of uh, patients that have used this and I don't think they know this. So that's kind of interesting because of the concern for malformation of the fetus upon uh, implantation of the egg. So that was kind of interesting. So moving on to monoclonal antibodies, which has a, a quite, we've talked about a little bit on the last uh, podcast. So that is approved within 10 days. It's intravenous. There's a whole bunch of them that we talked about last time. I'll read some of the names in just a moment. And so I just want to go through some of the risk factors. So I think all doctors that have prescribed monoclonal antibodies uh, either prescribed it for patients that were on the lower risk profile. And we ha I have some people that I know that were not even on the high risk profile that gone monoclonal antibodies. But basically the idea is that you you have criteria that you need to have to get this. So one of them is at least 12 years old, uh, weighing at least 88 pounds, you've tested positive for COVID, uh, mild to moderate symptoms, you have had symptoms within 10 days and you're at high risk. And that's where the criteria kind of is a little unclear. A uh, high risk is considered to be at least 65 years old, obese or overweight, according to the CDC prevention uh, criteria models. But that is a kind of sliding scale for some for some doctors and patients. Chronic kidney disease, diabetes, a condition that can weaken or suppress your immune system like autoimmune disease, heart conditions like heart failure, cardio, car, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies, high blood pressure, chronic lung disease such as COPD, asthma, cystic fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, sickle cell disease, neurodevelopmental disorders such as cerebral palsy, uh, having a medical device such as a tracheostomy, gastrostomy, or a positive pressure ventilation. Uh, so there's that's kind of the criteria, but I've had patients that I know that have had it for other things such as uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, anemia, you know, there's all these different kind of things that people are getting it for. Now, it's not without risk. I, I think every single patient I've had or friend that told me they've had it, had a side effect. I've had three friends that had it. They said they were wiped out. One particularly said they felt like a Mack truck had hit them and they were out for a full day. They were in bed for a full day. So I, it's hard to know whether it's gonna be worth it for those patients that are not high risk. And these, these are friends that weren't kind of borderline. They, they wanted to get better, they had to get back to work, but it did flat them out for about a, for a day. Uh, when I had COVID, I did not use it because I was getting better. So that was kind of helpful. And so that is what monoclonal antibodies are all about. And the one that we've talked about a little bit, the controversial versus non-controversial ones, the one that's not controversial in terms of using or testing against fetal stem cells uh, has a long name, Tokli Z Mubab. And that's kind of one you might want to ask for if you have any concerns because the rest of them were tested using fetal stem cells. Okay, that's pretty much it. The last thing I'll mention to put a plug in for the natural things, I think this whole COVID uh, pandemic has opened a lot of doctors and surgeons eyes to the pharmaceutical companies and the way hospitals work. Uh, we've always known there's a pharmaceutical component in medicine. Uh, in medical school, we are definitely taught how to prescribe this drug and this drug and this drug, and we are taught zero about diet. I'd say 
pretty much when I was in medicine, zero about diet and pretty much zero about natural medication. So there's that training that you get as a doctor. You spend a lot of time and, and effort on learning pharmacology and drug, you know, what, what do you prescribe for this drug and this drug? And we don't get the natural stuff. And when you combine that with kind of hospitals getting incentives for having a COVID patient or they get more money when somebody is listed as a COVID death. We know this now and it's important for all of us and doctors and everybody searching for the truth to find the truth about this. Where did the virus come from? What? Why did we get it? What's the right treatment? Do natural treatments work? Don't block our YouTube videos if we talk about medicine uh, as medical information. That doesn't make any sense. Let's talk about this openly. And, you know, we want to find out what are the financial incentives people are getting when they prescribe a drug. Years ago at Harvard, they cracked down on pharmaceutical companies providing lunches to the doctors for what we call drug dinners or drug lunches. And they really cracked down of it, on it. And a lot of doctors were kind of pushing back saying, well, it's not influencing me. It's not influencing me. But I think it does. And I think it's something that we as patients or future patients need to ask those questions. What is the doctor's incentives? What are the hospital's incentives? What are the truth behind the numbers we're seeing? Where's the money going? Because a lot of this can be related to financial incentives, unfortunately. It's human nature, of course. So things like N-acetylcysteine, for instance, which I talked about briefly last podcast, which is, I think, over the counter. We've used it for years for cystic fibrosis. We use it as a drop for filamentary keratitis. There's really no money in this. There's no money in, in at NAC. You can get it over the counter, I think, on Amazon. It's an, it's basically a um, trying to anti-inflammatory, trying to decrease your cytokine storm. Uh, it's given 600 milligrams BID. I mean, when you read this, you're like, oh my gosh, this is so not too hard to get. No money in that, but nobody's gonna talk about that. So in those parting words, I hope this video doesn't get taken down by YouTube for medical misinformation. Uh, the video I did with sister, Dr. Sister Dee Dee Byrne, who is a surgeon and myself talking about medicine got taken down. That doesn't make any sense to me. We're two surgeons talking about medicine. This is not medical misinformation. This is questioning what is the right treatment for our patients. We've done this for years. This is what doctors do. We talk about what's right for our patients. So I hope everyone listening will help us do something to get that truth out. We do not want to live in a place where doctors cannot talk about what might work and talk about what future studies should entail. That's what America is all about. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I hope you will please pass this on to friends and family. And thank you for subscribing. Thank you.